If you had a magic wand and could change one thing in your life for the better, what would you change? Would it be more money or a bigger home or wellness? I hope you choose wellness because if you have wellness, you have the potential to create everything else. Look at me as an evangelist of the imagination. Evangelist means bringing good news. And the good news is that you have the capacity and the capability to harness your imagination and create your own strategy for wellness. But the question is, what is the imagination? Now, imagination is elusive. Uh, we have a couple hints. We have a hint from Mark Twain who said, you can't depend on your eyes when your imagination is out of focus. And from Albert Einstein who said, imagination is everything. It is a preview of life's coming attractions. But the reality is the imagination is like a slightly crazy, hyperactive, wild child that can lose its focus at the snap of a finger. If it focuses on fear, you have guilt, you have high stress, you have anger. But if it focuses on love, you have compassion, you have forgiveness. So the key is how do you learn to take that child and focus it in the right direction? So you ready to take your imagination for a ride? Good. I have a lemon. And in a few moments, I'm going to count to three and take a bite out of this lemon. So I want you to imagine, to visualize that you have a lemon. And when I bite mine, you bite yours. Now really, the only thing you have to remember is that a lemon has a lot of juice inside of it. So, ready? One, focus, two, three. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I need some feedback from you. How many of you, either just before I bit the lemon, at the very moment I bit the lemon, or slightly after I bit the lemon, had some kind of a response to that? Just raise your hands. Raise them up really high. Now look around and notice the number of hands up. Good. And if you had to give a, a very quick estimate, percentage wise, what would you say? About 95, I heard it said, it's always about 95. It doesn't matter if the audience is 10,000 or 1,000. So think about what just happened. This is the power of pure imagination. You just had a biochemical, neurological response out of nothing, nothing. And that's the power of the mind. Somehow, through your imagination, you made this up. And you know what? You create all your experience every moment of every day by the way you visualize and where you focus. It affects your mood, it affects your attitude, it affects your choices, it affects your behavior in general, and of course, your wellness. And here's an imagination alert. You never have to put in any effort or work hard to create a negative future, ever. We are engineered to survive. So what we do is we worry a lot. We make more stuff up than you could imagine. Then we create problems that we don't have because genetically we're problem solvers. So in order to create a strategy for wellness, it's really about learning to focus, to harness that. I'm going to take you on a personal journey with me. Uh, about five years ago, I received a call from a British film director and writer uh, by the name of Robin Hardy. And he had seen my hypnosis show many, many years before, and he's been looking for a film project for me. So he called me up. I was so delighted. He said, James, I'm making a sequel to my previous film, which was The Wicker Man. It's called The Wicker Tree. And I have a part for you. Would you like to do it? Yes. Great. Bye. I didn't ask what the role was. Next day, he called back. He said, oh, by the way, do you tap dance? play the guitar, and can you do a very specific Eastern Texas dialect? And I took a big breath and I went, um, no, but I can learn. He said, I knew you'd say that. Good. Bye. I'll see you in Scotland. So I got off the phone. I called a friend of mine who taught me a basic tap dancing step in cowboy boots. 
called another friend of mine who taught me four chords on a guitar. I hired probably the best dialect coach in the movie business who just happened to live about a mile from me. And a friend of mine who's an Academy Award winning actor gave me the best advice ever. He said, read the script 500 times before you even start to develop a character. So I went out and bought one of those little hand counters and hour after hour, day after day, week after week, I did this part over and over and over and over and suddenly my imagination created the miracle of what imaginations do. And the character of the Reverend Moriarty was born. So off to Scotland, my wife and I went. We were there for a little over two weeks. When I got back, we returned home, I fell into a profound depression, uh, a feeling that was really foreign to me. And it lasted for three days. At the end of three days, I was getting nervous. So I went to my physician who gave me a little uh, exam. And then he sent me to my cardiologist who did an echocardiogram. And that night, I was going out to uh, dinner with a buddy of mine. He was taking me out for a lobster and a martini. And my cell phone rang before he got there. It was my cardiologist who basically said this. I know that you're a very stubborn man. But your echocardiogram shows that you have a large aortic aneurysm, and if you're lucky, you have a month to live. I had more than one martini, by the way. Uh, then I went home and told my wife, and we had to deal with that fear. But I also realized that I had to focus on something other than me and my situation. I had to focus on something I could control. And I also needed to put my energy in something other than worrying day in and day out. So I had an idea. I would create a program for other surgery patients that would minimize or reduce their stress, help them heal faster, get off drugs sooner. And that was the seed for what is now the patient pre op post op healing therapy program. Uh, which I am very proud to say that is now endorsed by the head of cardiothoracic surgery at Yale New Haven Hospital, my friend and surgeon, Dr. John Eleftiriades. After that, I had to investigate what this surgery entailed. So like so many people uh, do, which is always a mistake, is to go to the web. Well, I found out that I would be put in a state of hypothermia. My heart stopped. My chest cut open. Uh, my valve, uh, put a pig valve in, and also replaced the aneurysm, put me back together. And I found a picture on the web, the BBC News, which expresses, and this is about this unique surgery. Right? So this, this is it. It's called dead for an hour. Well, let's just say that I had to ramp up my meditation. <laughs> I also decided I needed to look at my career and see what was useful, what I could pull out of it. So the first area that I looked at was leadership. But a, a corporation engaged me to study leaders throughout the world, past leaders and present leaders, to see if I could identify the top traits of all these leaders that were morally and culturally neutral. And the first trait is the, the ability to craft a future vision that can motivate people forward, inspire people, get them on board a project, and of course to communicate that vision. Athletes, years I've worked with athletes, track, tennis, golf, powerlifting, football, two weeks ago a baseball team. The core skill of success in athletics is mental rehearsal. The ability to rehearse or visualize success in advance. It instills self-confidence and it creates an instant motivator. As a personal coach for 40 years, people come to me, whatever their issue, I help them identify what they want to achieve, a goal, and a strategy to get there. And again, visualization on a daily basis becomes paramount to achievement. Lastly, patience. My colleagues and I for many, many years have developed and worked with cancer, uh, programs to help uh, cancer patients deal with the nausea of chemotherapy and also reduce pain. And so 
this, all these four kept pointing to the power of visualization, the power of vision. And then the recent research in the brain has been incredible. It absolutely shows that our brain remains flexible, malleable, plastic, well into our 70s, and we can literally change our brain through what? Visualization. <laughs> but it's more than visualization. It's the power of the story. It's the power of the stories that we tell ourselves. The power of the story, stories are what changes our brain, for the better or not, depending on the story we tell. So the story is everything, and when we can learn to harness the story in a way that affects us on our biochemical level, and remember we are as human beings programmed to live and grow from stories. If I asked you to recall an event from your past that was made you angry, anger is a good thing, that's a common thing. If I really had you get into that, here's what would happen. Your brain would re release a, a variety pack of chemicals, including cortisol and adrenaline, not good unless you're going into battle. But if I asked you to recall something powerfully emotionally loving, you would get a little shot in your brain of that feel-good chemical dopamine. So how we tell ourselves the story not only creates our experience, but it also affects other people. So I'm going to give you a little background on how the mind works. Now this is the quickest peek into the mind that anyone's ever done. So I asked all the neurologists, psychologists, psychiatrists of the world to forgive me. You are of two minds, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. The conscious mind is that rational part of your brain that thinks. It's the center of our ability to, uh, to plan. It is uh, the part of us that worries. It's the part of us that's critical. And it's that little voice in your head that you talk to yourself with. Now, if you don't know what little voice that is, it's the one that's going, what little voice is that guy talking about? <laughs> it's our self-talk. One of the keys to learning to manage your mind is to manage that self-talk. And the good thing, it is the visionary. The conscious mind is able to project in the future and imagine scenario, multiple futures, not just one future. That's the newest part of our brain. The subconscious is extremely different. It doesn't think. It is the center of our DNA, storehouse of our memories, uh, also the center of our emotions, and it does the heavy lifting. It runs our organs in our body, which frees up the conscious mind to do what it does, to plan, make up stuff, get upset, worry. The best part of the subconscious mind is this to me. It cannot tell the difference between a real emotional experience or an imagined experience emotional experience. Think about that, period. It accepts suggestion without question. It doesn't analyze it, it just does what it does. There was a study done at uh, Harvard uh, uh, Medical School, and a group of people, adults, uh, were taught a one-handed five-finger exercise. It's very simple. And the group was divided in half. Half the people were instructed to practice two hours a day for five days, right? So physically practice. The other group was instructed to imagine practicing two hours a day for five days. No physical movement. At the end of five days, brains were measured. Growth in the motor cortex, identical in the people that physically practice and imagine. Think about the power of the subconscious. The question is, what mind really controls you? So if you, if you are control freaks, perhaps you should close your eyes for this. The most recent brain research strongly indicates that the subconscious controls the non-thinking, controls 90% of our choices, and the conscious mind controls 10%. So where does that leave us? Where it leaves us, is we better learn how to use the 10% to influence the 90% because you can't control it.
you can only influence. My entire thought about how the mind works changed a few years ago. Now, there, by the way, there have been many people wrestling with this question back to 370 BC uh, with Plato and his chariot with two horses about the mind, and then in the 19th century, Freud, the iceberg, 10% above the water was the conscious mind. I was lecturing in India, and I decided I wanted to ride an elephant. Now, I am a really, really good horseback rider, so I said, what should be a problem with an elephant, right? Wrong. I would have to say it was one of the most terrifying experiences that has ever happened to me because I had no control. Two years later, I'm reading an insightful book by a man who's become a friend, Dr. Jonathan Haidt, called The Happiness Hypothesis. And in it, Jonathan uses a metaphor for the mind as a very small little writer, intelligent, sitting atop this huge 15,000 pound stubborn elephant, the subconscious. So, you are the elephant and the rider. So let's bring all this together with what I consider the most powerful tools to change your brain for the better and create a wellness strategy. And I call this the four keys to create a wellness strategy. Adjust your attitude, number one. My third day in ICU, I started to quiz the nurses with a single question. Do you believe attitude makes a difference in a patient's healing? Those answers coupled with thousands of people I've talked to since doctors, uh, surgeons, and also healthcare professionals all point to the same conclusion. Those that have the most post-surgery problems are the people who are angry, who are disrespectful to the, in the hospital, to the staff, and who fight with their visiting friends and relatives. Those who, are, who have the best results from surgery, even when it seems that they shouldn't, are the people that are loving, are the people that are compassionate, the people that show gratitude, are the people that have loving relationships. Dr. Herbert Benson is one of my heroes. He's um, founder of the Mind Body uh, Wellness Institute at Massachusetts General Hospital. And he wrote a book that changed my life called The Relaxation Response. He said that there are thousands of articles written on how the mind and the brain affect the body. But when a patient can focus on something other than illness, it releases the body's natural capacity to heal. So, key number two, express your gratitude. Studies prove, not show, prove that the expression of gratitude affects us on a deep biochemical level. It affects our perceptions, again, our moods, it affects our friendships, it affects the survival of marriages. So I'm giving you what I give every client of mine. It's a simple exercise, takes one minute. If you start it tonight, before you go to bed, you write five things for which you're grateful. That's it. You go to sleep, you get up, you read the list, you circle one of them. It will change your life for the better. Key number three, create a solid support system. According to the Mayo Clinic, those people who have strong social support networks are not only healthier, but live longer. So how do you create a network? Now here's a little fact about the mind. We are wired genetically for reciprocity, returning a favor for a favor given. So if you make a commitment when you leave here to go out and do unlimited random acts of kindness on a consistent basis without expecting or asking for anything, when you need support, it will be there, probably more than you've ever dreamed about. Key number four, create a vision that will carry you through a crisis. It's mandatory in healing. It's mandatory for self-confidence, mandatory for the body to instill belief and hope, but to create a strategy for wellness, it's a must. And that is that, as I mentioned earlier, what you do is you craft a future wellness strategy for you and what it looks and feels like. Those are two very important, feeling and emotion. And then you move it into the future. So you're as if you were there, then twice a day, you reinforce this belief. It only takes five minutes each time. You take a big breath, close your eyes, summon up your imagination like you did with the lemon. You project yourself in the future, in it like a hologram, and imagine what that looks like. 
that will create, those four points will help create your strategy for wellness. And here is some more good news. Uh, you also know probably genetically we're designed to model behavior. So you become a leader in wellness without even knowing it because people will watch you and model your behavior. In fact, your wellness strategy may just become viral because people learn from people by watching, by experiencing. So I'd like to close this with a few words from one of the wisest characters um, in the world that I could, could quote, Willy Wonka. <laughs> if you want to view paradise, simply look around and view it. Anything you want to do, do it. Want to change the world? There's nothing to it. Thank you.